Hello, and welcome to our 24th edition of FSI Fridays. I'm Johansson, live in Charlotte, joined by... Edwin, live in Boston. Hey, Edwin, what do we have lined up for today? Happy Friday, Johansson, and all of those watching or on YouTube. Today, we're going to talk about what GitHub is and why it's so awesome that there are 50 million plus developers loving it. Next, we'll dive deeper into DevSecOps and how GitHub helps secure the complete software lifecycle and how you modernize for building for cloud native applications. Third, we'll get a glimpse of what it looks like as well as cover a case study with a large financial services organization and best practices and lessons learned. Then we'll wrap it up with Q&A today on FS. It's our Fridays. <laughs> As a quick reminder, we'll spend around 30 minutes on today's topic and leave the last 10 minutes to address any burning questions. So please use the Q&A window and we'll monitor for questions during the presentation. If you're watching the recording, feel free to use the comments below to ask your question. So let's get started and meet the presenters for today. Joe Hansen, who's our special guest this week? Thanks, Edwin. So we are honored to join by three guests today and FSI Fridays first. Let's first start with David Atik. Thanks for being on the show today, Dave. Can you tell the audience know what your role is at GitHub and what your typical day entails? We'll also hear that a positive thing to come out of COVID is that your eight-year-old is helping you save a little bit more money these days. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Microsoft for having us. Number one, uh, really excited to be here. So, David Teak with GitHub. I lead our East Region Enterprise Solutions Group here for for GitHub. Um, yeah, so so it's funny if you look at that picture of me there, right? Uh, you can see a little bit more hair on the top of the head. Uh, what, back in March when COVID started, I basically handed my eight-year-old daughter a pair of clippers and I said, here, we got to go do something new. You know, funny enough, she's the one that's probably going to cause me to lose my hair anyway. So I let her handle the, uh, handle the job. Great to be here though. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Dave. I remember, uh, I think one of the first haircuts after COVID, uh, I had let my wife have the clippers and I said, just, you know, keep it short. And she shaved the top of the head off. So I had short hair up top uh, unintentionally, but that's a different story. I can't believe I'm saying that right now. Um, anyway, so we're also joined by Eric Barron. Eric, talk to us about your daily life at GitHub. And I heard uh, some fun fact is somewhat a little opposite of Dave's, but not quite from the financial perspective. Yeah, thanks so much, Edwin. So, uh, hi all. My name is Eric Barron. Uh, I'm the director of enterprise solutions sales at GitHub. And really, what we focus on is how do we help our customers really maximize the value out of the cloud service motions that they are trying to drive for these big buzzwords around digital transformation and DevSecOps, which we'll get into. This is a space that is kind of near and dear to my heart. I've done several tours, kind of through Microsoft. Uh, and prior to coming to GitHub, I actually managed the global DevOps segment for regulated industries at AWS. So a pleasure to be here and really looking forward to work at, work on all of this with you. Uh, my quick fun fact is as Dave's uh, hair has kind of gone away, mine has now migrated down to the face if you look at that picture that we have up on the screen. So uh, it was a better time than ever with the COVID lockdown to get a chance to kind of grow out a beard. So here we are, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Edwin. Thanks, Eric. Um, last but not least, we also have Isaac Cohen. Welcome to the show. What's your role at GitHub? And I heard during COVID, you learned how to garden and grow tomatoes and herbs. Yeah, so hi, my name is Isaac Cohen. I'm part of the Global Field Architecture team here at GitHub. Really more on the technical side of everything um, that we have. Uh, you know, it's funny, before GitHub, I, I used to work in CICD and then ran uh, DevOps for a large financial services company. So I've really been in DevOps for, or DevSecOps for probably about the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> as you mentioned, I, I learned how to garden. Uh, so I was gardening some tomatoes and some herbs during COVID. But what's truly amazing about that is that I am New York City born and bred. So as a person who's actually allergic to grass, I learned how to garden. <laughs> That is an amazing fact. Thanks for sharing. Um, so let's get right to it. See what I did there. Uh, Dave, I'm a big fan of GitHub. 50 million plus developers are fans as they're using it. And apparently Microsoft is a huge fan since it acquired GitHub for $7.5 billion. Can you tell the audience a quick background on GitHub, why it's worth so much and why a financial services focused audience should care? Sure, absolutely. You know, great question. So let me let me start with a little bit of an overview of GitHub for anybody that's really not familiar with the platform. You know, number one, we're incredibly proud, you know, of the fact that GitHub is the largest developer community on earth. It's where most innovative companies collaborate with open source, 
to deliver customer value. You know, as stewards of this community, we've learned a lot about what it takes to drive innovation at scale. So, you know, going back, GitHub, you know, started as about a platform for developers to work together and collaborate on interesting projects from anywhere in the world. Uh, GitHub has grown beyond just source control now, including CICD, artifact storage, security tools, as well as the best third-party integrations, allowing developers to really use the tools that fit their needs. You know, we've been really busy here at GitHub over the past four years. So if you think about what we offer from a platform perspective, you might be familiar with going out to github.com, but we also offer an enterprise solution for organizations. You know, customers have different options for deployment. We believe that most enterprises should be on the cloud. It's secure, high performing, and you don't have to manage the infrastructure yourself. However, we also understand organizations and financial services and other, other highly regulated industries have specific needs. The great news is that we have enterprise deployment options that meet the requirements, whether it's a SaaS platform, whether it's our SaaS platform, whether it's you need to deploy on-prem or even a new managed service offering that we're introducing here soon. So to kind of get to that second part of, you know, hey, why was GitHub worth you know, seven and a half billion dollars? Um, and really what's the importance behind it? You know, as we see the modernization of DevSecOps and development practices and engineering practices, the rise of open source software, it's really fundamentally changed the way software has been built, is being built in the enterprise. You know, today, 99% of large enterprises um, or large enterprise applications, you know, rely on open source software. And up to 90% of the code in the new applications consist of open source code. So in addition to open source code, you know, we have found that the top most innovative companies are also sharing code behind the firewall between their teams. And really it's this concept of inner sourcing. It's, it's taking the lessons learned from the open source community and bringing them behind the firewall and building the same type of model and engineering practices um, to accelerate value. It. So, you know, this sharing of code, whether it's application, infrastructure, infrastructure, security, policy code, you know, both open source and inner source is really what's dramatically accelerating the development and time to market for building applications in the cloud. You know, also, the fact that you have 50 plus million developers using the platform allows us to not only um, derive insights on how developers work, but also allows, the use, allows us to use the data to drive better security. You know, for instance, you know, we know when you know, vulnerabilities are first introduced into open source projects. So we can immediately identify and notify developers using those package. We'll talk a little bit more about security later on, but hopefully that gives you a really good idea of really what GitHub is and the value behind the platform. Thank you, Eric. That was a great background and primer for our audience here. So let's turn over to you, Eric. Tell us when customers come to you, come to GitHub. Um, what are they asking? What do they need help with? And really, you know, for our FSI focused audience here, how are financial services customers leveraging GitHub today? A hundred percent. And 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 that was a great segue into this. Because remember, the value of GitHub, right? Git's been around forever, but Git made it easy to build over the internet. And GitHub said it's cool to build over the internet, but it's cooler to find people who are building the things that I am so that we can build together. And that constant has created this proliferation of as code assets that allow the implementation of the DevSecOps discipline or cloud service transformation to really be modularized, to be able to allow teams who've never really built or been developers before to consume and use the best examples from the open source community. So what's super important to take away from why the FSI base and why our customers in the regulated space in particular are embracing this, it's because typical customers who are coming from more kind of traditional IT environments realize that as I move towards cloud-oriented architecture, I need to build developer competencies in areas I've never really needed them before, but it's critical. So it's really important for you to take away with this and why GitHub has kind of become and cemented itself 
as the core of the overall transformation life cycle. It's because in the cloud, everyone who has a stake becomes a developer. If you want to utilize the cloud endpoint in a value-based way, not simply lift and shift, but a way that actually helps you engineer how you're going to build those next services and feature sets. And for a lot of our customers, when they talk to us, DevSecOps is digital transformation. DevSecOps is as code practices. And what they're asking us for is you all are working with the most innovative companies in the world. They have put GitHub at the core of this innovation. How do I make use of that? How do I go and build my implementation of cloud services the way the Valley does it? And that's what GitHub really represents. I think you said it definitely. Um, you know, it's all about transformation, especially this last year. So Eric, you know, many of our financial services customers today, as they shift towards cloud, they try to do things the way they've done things in their on-premise data center as it relates to deploying infrastructure, but that doesn't really scale in a cloud world and presents additional challenges. At some point, I've heard between a year and 18 months, it starts getting more expensive to run that workload in the cloud endpoint. Why is that? You know, it's, it's a great question. It's an interesting paradigm having had the chance to kind of see it across two of the major global cloud scale hyperscale providers in AWS and Azure. And what happens with a lot of customers is what they do is the CTO comes down and says, I want to sunset the data center business. We need to go and be able to do our operational to capital or capital expenditure or operating expenditure moves by leveraging cloud services and create these great elastic and scalable infrastructures that allow us to go up and scale down, right? And what happens is customers will take those workloads and drop it onto the infrastructure as a service endpoint. But the reason over a 12 to 18 month period it starts becoming more expensive is just because we've dropped it over, yes, you get those cost savings initially. But if you haven't engineered the process by which we are treating the cloud endpoint as a code base, because that is what it is. Azure Resource Manager, Terraform, these are provisioning templates that create a code infrastructure or a code base to turn resources on in a cloud endpoint. That can be iterated on, that can be changed, just like we can do that with application libraries. And the reason after 12 to 18 months, we start seeing the actual workloads become more expensive is because customers get that initial uh, savings. They start investing it into new features, but they haven't changed the practice underneath and they're treating the cloud endpoint the way they're using the traditional data center footprint. And what happens in that scenario is inevitably it becomes more expensive to run in the platform. And that's really where we get engaged at the beginning of the transformation motion, no matter where the customer is in the journey, whether they are deeply embedded into the cloud world in the infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or even moving into these very forward leaning architectures, all the way to we're just starting to get our feet wet with kind of these new ways and these new programming paradigms. Eric, you know, I think that's, that's a really good context to, you know, why GitHub and, you know, the, op, the whole cost optimization piece um, and kind of making that shift over. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about how GitHub is helping our customers uh, in financial services solve this specific challenge? Absolutely. So if we think about if, if, if cloud and the cloud backend is a bucket of Legos, right? And at the end of the day, the cloud providers all have similar Legos with unique feature sets that go into them. What GitHub represents is the largest collection of Lego books in the world to build your cloud implementation off the best examples of that in the industry. A common misconception is that I'm going to go use GitHub for packages and application libraries. Some of the largest code bases and communities that exist on GitHub are those who are building Azure Resource Manager templates or Terraform templates. And how we can actually go and meet with, talk to, and use all of the logic that the best examples of cloud in the industry have been put forward in the, in, in the actual community. That's what GitHub is. 
GitHub is how do I put it together? And if we go to that example of the CTO coming down and saying, we need to sunset two or three data centers, and you have an operational and security and compliance staff who's never really built in an as code way, the power of being able to go to that audience and say, use the open source assets that are out there to accelerate your deployment. Many times you're able to actually use up to 99% of a template that marries up to what your sizing is in those data centers to start this move. And because we have a term at GitHub called inner sourcing, if I have the ability to go into the open source repositories and consume from GitHub, that does not mean, as Dave articulated the and the enterprise side, that if I'm using the enterprise feature sets of GitHub, that I have to give everything away to open source. Many times there are multiple migration or modernization teams that are tasked with how do I go and really maximize the use of cloud. And being able to migrate that first workload then becomes the code base that's templatized and repeatable for multiple other migration teams to build their cloud implementation off the successes of that first team. And remember, the first team was able to build their implementation from what might be a very sophisticated, technologically advanced implementation of cloud in the industry, that if we were looking at it bare bones and just starting from scratch, would be a very, very heavy uphill battle for teams that never really have written that kind of code before, either in trying to build the enablement or the amount of services that would be required to go in and really build that for the customer. So GitHub is this massive facility that harnesses the power of open source, builds these skill sets, and allows teams to really build on the shoulders of giants at the app layer and the cloud endpoint layer, as well as all of the security and policy that we want to inject into that workload migration to ensure we're meeting the overall regulatory hurdles and standards that we need to as a regulated entity. Uh, Eric, I mean, that resonates with me. It's been almost a decade since I've been coding, uh, but uh, having that template and just kind of making life easier, uh, I'm sure a lot of our developers are loving that. And it's really incredible and really amazing to see this massive adoption of open source logic or open source code that teams can make use of outside the classic dev use case, using this and applying this now to ops, infrastructure, security, et cetera. So Dave, from, from our financial services customers, cybersecurity is always top of mind. Thinking about vulnerabilities, how is GitHub ensuring secure consumption of logic and or open source? Every year we, uh, great question, Edwin. Every year we do release uh, something called the Optiverse. And like I, I mentioned in the beginning of the session, we take, we have access to all these insights and, and really are able to publish this information to really help empower developers based off of the trends, patterns, what we're seeing across GitHub. I um, totally recommend checking out some of these reports. Um, this year, we did a little something different. We actually provided deeper analysis in, in three key reports. One of those uh, is, is also happens to be on security. So Dave, you know, when you think about the proliferation of all these assets inside of GitHub, you know, I think Eric talked about it as being Lego blocks. Now, uh, you know, our customers are using this consumption to kind of fuel what might be 90% of their development effort. So from a financial services lens, how is GitHub helping our financial services customers address what might be security concerns in some of those Lego blocks or in part of that life cycle? Yeah, great. And, and, you know, we're, as Eric mentioned, we're constantly asked about how do we move faster? How do we develop for cloud native applications? You know, as application development shifts more towards that cloud, that, that cloud native process, you know, teams need to adopt and change their processes to, to, to really modify how, their life cycle as well. So moving from traditional siloed approaches, taking that as code practice for engineering, Again, application code, infrastructure code, security policy, all is code where Git becomes, GitHub, that repo becomes the source of truth for everything that they're doing. And GitHub is on a mission to solve the security issues within this developer workflow. This is you know, really important to us. And this means offering tools and methods to secure the entire application development process, shifting security left, and building, you know, and, you know, 
and allowing build without slowing down innovation by con you know with by constantly scanning code as it's created not just at the end of the life cycle before it actually gets deployed. Uh, Dave, that definitely makes sense. I love how it's scanning while it's being created, right? And uh, rather than waiting all the way to the end. Uh, but I know our audience loves seeing demos as much as Johansson and I do, but seeing that we have such limited time, we have to limit it yes. to screenshots and animated GIFs, but uh, let's make this real for our audience. Can you walk through a few scenarios so we can get a sense of what um, these amazing solutions look like? And since security is a pinnacle requirement for our FSI customers, can you start there and walk us through how car, uh, how our financial services customers can make sure their code is secure and up to date. Yeah, so 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 great question again. Securing custom code, you know, before it's actually deployed. This means catching vulnerabilities before they ever make it into production and checking the code, you know, the deployed application for common misconfigurations, vulnerabilities. Um, what you can see here is we're doing, you know, automated security checks inside a pull request, right? Giving you, um, you know, confidence scores on merges based off of open source or other application code that you have um, that you're looking to, to update and, and, and deploy into an application. Um, another example, if you move forward, is really about securing dependencies, right, in open source, right? As I mentioned at the beginning of the session, uh, you know, oh, GitHub is the home to open source development. So we know first when there's vulnerabilities in open source packages. So as enterprises, as organizations are consuming that those open source packages, we're able to um, update and alert you to when we notice that there's issues inside of the packages that you're consuming. Um, and we even go as far as um, automatically creating a, a pull request and recommending th what dependency you should upgrade to as well. Dave, I think that's really powerful for you know our customers thinking about how GitHub can actually help customers track those dependencies and understand any vulnerabilities in their code. Um, one of the things that was mentioned earlier is how GitHub is extremely helpful in providing insights. And I think you just kind of alluded to that a little bit. How does that work and help from a business impact perspective? Yeah, so, so beyond just alerting a specific team to where there's maybe vulnerabilities in the packages that they're, they're consuming, we're providing um, insights across the organization to help you understand you know, where those critical vulnerabilities are, moderate vulnerabilities are across the entire enterprise and organization so that you can take action and remediate as quickly as possible. Um, you can see, I think I, I had shared some of the metrics around how long it takes and or, you know, how, off, how long vulnerabilities sometimes go um, unpatched. So this is some great, great data and some, some, uh, a great opportunity for enterprises to understand um, quickly where they need to go remediate issues in their code. Uh, Dave, we've also heard GitHub is releasing even more features to help organizations secure their code. Can you tell me what else you're working on? Yeah, exciting stuff. And, and if you didn't see, we just had our annual GitHub universe um, this past week. So really a, a number of good features, number of nice new capabilities that we've released. So highly recommend you check out universe. But we're, we're you know, we're building on top of uh, some of the stuff that we already had today. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, let uh, Isaac jump in here. He's the security expert on the team. But a couple of new things that we're releasing really around code scanning, um, variant code analysis. This is based off of the, the acquisition of SEML last year, as well as uh, credential scanning as well. Isaac, anything you'd like to add into some of the uh, new capabilities we're releasing? Sure. Yeah, so really what I've been excited about is code scanning. Um, code scanning allows you to find these code level vulnerabilities, either within public repositories or also within your private code as well. So this is where we are looking for like the SQL injection vulnerabilities or the cross-site scripting vulnerability, really the, the vulnerabilities that can actually leave you open to attack. But what's so interesting about this is that it's now directly integrated as part of the GitHub native experience, which means that you can start to be able to find these issues before they ever make it to production or before you ever merge those changes into your code. 
Um, on the back end, on the back end, we actually use this this engine that Dave had just mentioned, the uh, CodeQL, um, that is a semantic code engine that allows us to to model your code and trace your code from source to sync. So this powerful engine is working in the background, um, but from a developer experience, they're able to view these results within the GitHub native experience within the tool that they love. Isaac, thanks for sharing that. I mean, it's fascinating to see how GitHub uh, is looking to address the security of the supply chain. So how are financial services customers leveraging these practices today? And really what I'm trying to get at is what is GitHub doing for financial services customers that is different than the way other software dev or DevOps platforms are being leveraged? Yeah, and this is kind of an interesting conversation that we can have, right? Because at the end of the day, DevOps sought to solve two problems, speed and consistency. If I'm a development team talking to operations, wanting to build a new feature or change, and it's taking me three to six months to get resources to be able to actually build that change, or maybe I'm in the cloud, but it's still taking me a week or two, that's too long. And we all know that time to innovation is everything. So what we see happens a lot of times, boxes and dev test staging and production are not different sizes because I'm terrible at PowerPoint. I'm not great. But what it represents is the operational teams is rebuilding each of these, iterating on them, and not creating the necessary consistency. And that hurts our ability to move fast. And how many times have you as an ops team gotten something into test? You start building out the environment, start looking and making the testing changes or looking to see what the developers built. Something breaks. You call the development teams and say, hey, you gave me a bad code drop and the development teams tells you to go pound sand because it built and was on their desktop. So that discipline and the ability to kind of work in an ecosystem to unify those teams is critical. And it needs to be enabled by a tooling platform that creates that type of inner sourcing visibility. The other thing that happens is security comes in right before the release goes to production. And it's because security teams are not building in an as code orientation. Security teams are not able to inject compliance rules, whether it be PCI, whether it be a regulatory framework that you are building custom into your environment. And this is where it can, you might actually have implemented an agile software development and implemented DevOps, but if your security team comes in before production, you are literally at a point, you could see your releases, even if you're building new features every three weeks, delay maybe even a year. That's not agile, that's not DevOps. And then because each of these teams don't have visibility, all the application code, all the security code, and all the way we're provisioning resources and operation sits in different places with different teams. Now, if we go to the next slide here, I can kind of give you a little flavor of really where GitHub is landing and how it's being used. So GitHub and one of the fun of successful implementations of DevSecOps in the industry is to standardize your version control in a collaborative, open, visible platform behind your firewall for other enterprise teams. You want security teams to go beyond just the baseline infrastructure controls that I'm inheriting in the Azure endpoint or the cloud service endpoint. You want operational teams to be going out and consuming Azure Resource Manager or Terraform templates or what other provisioning engine you have in the cloud platform that you are leveraging and being able to build and iterate on that to make it cheaper. And you want your developers to be able to see what those teams are doing so that when I want to build a new feature, I have an entire view into what resources are available for me to spin up and make my changes. And then we want it to be consistent. We want the dev test staging and production environments to be the same. And we want to be injecting security and compliance into every step of the life cycle. At the end of the day, GitHub gives you that inner sourcing visibility. But the other thing it does is we've been talking about securing the supply chain. 99% of production applications today are running some form of open source or have a dependency on an open source package in your environment. And when you version that code in GitHub, you are automatically given that view. Where is the open source running? What is my dependency? And as, as Isaac and David had talked about, when we're looking at putting 
and managing how the latest and greatest security researchers are applying those techniques to the most ubiquitously used coding platform in the world, it allows us to stay ahead of the security and compliance injection points way before we go to production. It's happening at the pull request or my team consuming an asset out of GitHub that I want to build on top of. This creates true centralization, creates repeatability of teams to accelerate time to value in the cloud platform while ensuring security and compliance at every phase of the process. Eric, you know, security and compliance uh, for our financial services customers is always top of mind. And I love to, you know, how you're, you talked about GitHub being used as really the core center of that developer security and operations lifecycle for cloud services application modernization and how it can actually increase that time to value. Now, there are many financial services customers that are actually already leveraging GitHub today. Can you talk maybe about one of our large financial services customers that has a public case study describing how they improve their software delivery by moving to GitHub? Absolutely, a great example of where this has become real is Nationwide. Nationwide was looking to really get their arms on in the beginning was, we know open source is running in our environment and we're using a whole bunch of different third party technologies to just give us the picture. And what they found was, if I know that my developers are already going to github.com to consume, but I'm putting those assets that I'm grabbing from open source into a different versioning engine, that isn't flexible or isn't creating any type of visibility into how those teams are using those assets, that, that, require, that creates a whole host of additional work for us. So they brought it in, they centralized, they standardized all of this code, whether it's development, operational, security logic, and how they are implementing these forward-leaning infrastructures so that they can automate that and focus on how do I change the application architecture? How do I start embracing microservices if I'm coming from a full stack environment? Or how do I start transitioning into serverless because the value of cloud and the value of the developer discipline is to save you money? And that's exactly what they've done. They were shocked at how much work was going into creating the visibility on open source assets, how much work was going into not being able to just share best practices as they embarked on these cloud service modernization efforts, sunsetting data centers, and the amount of work and savings that they were able to grab and now continue to build upon because you can automate the foundation of that every step of the way and now we go focus on what truly innovates for our business. That's what Nationwide is doing. Eric, thanks for sharing that story. And I encourage the folks watching, um, take a look at that case study using that link. I, it, it's a really good read. I, I, I read up on it last night. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Isaac, uh, let's turn it to you. So let's let's tie this all together since you used to run a DevOps uh, org at a large financial services industry organization. Can you provide your perspectives on how that was approached, discuss some of the challenges, and share some best practices where and how you've embraced this advanced security motion would certainly be appreciated by our audience. Yeah, of course. And what's funny is I was running DevOps really before that term DevOps, that buzzword came up to play. Um, and, and what's interesting is that you see really the same problems that DevOps were, was trying to solve over here with the DevSec, with the DevSec divide. Um, one of the things that I noticed was that ops tended to be a, a bottleneck when it came to DevOps. There were a lot of manual steps that had to happen in order for a developer to go into production. Well, the reality is that this is really the same thing going on with, with DevSec, where developers can get frustrated with security teams. I see a lot of times PDFs being thrown back and forth over a wall. We have to start to bridge those two worlds between Dev and Sec. And one of, the one of the main ways that I've seen being done in order to address that would be automation, right? Automation is the answer. Try to automate as much as you can to make the developers' lives as easy as possible. Um, but but that that brings us to the second challenge is focusing on the developers' lives. Now there is a difference between DevOps and DevSec, where DevSec, if you have a security issue, I mean that can actually bankrupt the company. So as an industry, we've very much been focusing and and sort of become obsessed with false positives, true positives. Um, but what we've lost sight is 
is is that idea of how do we actually get those vulnerabilities remediated or trying to optimize for that remediation rate to make sure that vulnerabilities actually get fixed. And the way you optimize for that is to focus on the developers, meet the developers where they are. You uh, build those tools directly within the development in environment. That way they are happy enough and that way they're not delaying fixing any vulnerabilities or any issues, but they're actually excited to do so. Um, and so the companies that have embraced this, that's really where you're starting to see the real DevSecOps transformations take place. Thanks, Isaac. You know, I think that those are really great perspectives and also kind of probably give shed some light for our other financial services customers that are listening here today. Um, our, our, I'm sure our audience is extremely excited about seeing how GitHub can enhance their current DevSecOps strategy and implementation. So Eric, where should they go next to learn more and maybe how can they reach out? Absolutely. So I think the first thing is the state of the Octaverse is a really fascinating report. Think about this, 50, 50 million plus of the smartest developers, smartest users of cloud in the world, going out and taking a look at how those teams are really embracing new trends and where the industry is going across the board. It's a fascinating read and there's lots of really interesting nuggets that you can glean. The second is GitHub Universe, as Dave articulated, was this week. It just closed yesterday and there has been a whole host of new announcements that we're building into the platform that, that I would highly encourage you to go take a look at. And obviously, if you don't have any familiar with GitHub, Go out to github.com and, and, and just get yourself a handle. It's, it's as easy as to sign up for for LinkedIn. This is where you go and see what is happening in the world of development. And if you really want to start playing with things, it can be as easy to go and find assets that you could make use of for your work today as it is to go to YouTube and look up how to play piano or how to play piano man in a certain video. It really becomes an interface that's that much of a portal into how you are gonna drive your transformation efforts. Obviously, we are your team. We all represent a part of the America sales teams as well as the global team here at, at GitHub wanting to help customers like yourselves really embrace these practices. So please, Dave, Isaac, myself, these are our handles. These are our live GitHub uh, aliases. You can go out and see the stuff that we're doing out of the open source community on github.com. You can also send us a direct email and we are ready to help dive into any of these scenarios more deeply to help you be successful with your overall journeys. Eric, Dave, Isaac, thank you for sharing your time and perspectives around GitHub. I'm positive our viewers have learned a wealth of valuable information. You get that right, Johansson. I did it again, sorry. Uh, so what we learned today is GitHub is way more than a consumer tool via github.com, but how there are a number of different managed services that provide a secure platform meeting the regulatory needs of financial services customers. As cloud implementations increasingly rely on as code principles for accelerated workload migration and modernization, GitHub is the de facto facility to build workload migration and modernization organization strategies based on the best implementations of the cloud in the industry. Through the power of open source adoption with GitHub as the source of truth, it can help deliver rapid customer success. Thanks, Edwin. You know, if you're interested in starting this journey or you're in the middle of it and would like some guidance, please reach out to your Microsoft account teams and or Eric and David, and we can schedule an envisioning session or follow up. So really great stuff here. Edwin, let's move to Q&A. What are some of our viewers asking? So get a question here from Anonymous um, asking about roadmap. Uh, what does GitHub vNext look like? I, I'm more than happy to take that. And, uh, you know, Isaac, if you wanted to add uh, any color or Dave. So, so, you know, post acquisition, GitHub is looking to really engineer an end-to-end -end development or DevOps platform experience for our customers. If you think about where we're starting, GitHub grew up as a best of breed hub, collaborative versioning engine that plugged into any possible tooling environment across the software development lifecycle that you all may want to make use of. And that is never going to change because the ability to integrate and be that centralization point is in our DNA. But our customers are asking us for more feature sets. We're going to be baking in new technologies. If you think about the Actions platform, we started with continuous integration and are moving to continuous delivery. The reason that's valuable is because the community that is building live Actions 
allows us to go to a customer and say, if you're trying to automate continuous integration or continuous delivery based on the industry and you're leveraging actions, go into the open source community and see what those teams are doing. And it becomes a centralized service native to GitHub that creates that free form consumption of how we're going to maximize that this environment. I think you're going to continue to see massive investment into ensuring the security and compliance of the open source code that our customers rely on every day. We believe we are stewards of that community. We believe that we need to protect that community and we work very, very actively with all of them. So over the course of time, you're going to see more and more capability coming down into GitHub to be a fully integrated software development DevSecOps platform that has this massive ecosystem and community behind it, fueling the best practice use of how our customers can very quickly maximize the implementation of the platform. Now, Isaac, Dave, I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to add to that, but that's really where we're going as a company. The one thing from my side that I was going to add, um, really related to what you were saying, Eric, is not only are we building that end-to-end -end software lifecycle, but we're going very, very deep in those different verticals. So you look at Actions being now the number one CICD platform on GitHub, or you look at GitHub Advanced Security um, having really amazing technology as part of that. It's not only building that breadth, but going very, very deep in these different um, in what was traditionally different parts of the SDLC, that's really what excites me. And, and the only other thing I would add is we have released a public roadmap out on github.com. So there is a repository you can go see what we're actually working on as part of uh, you know next features that we'll be dropping in, in GitHub. That's really, that's really great. Thank you. Um, we've got one last question in here before we have to wrap up. Um, some of our customers have to deal with FedRAMP low and FedRAMP high requirements. What can GitHub do to kind of help our, our financial services customers through this? So FedRAMP obviously is a core standard for the department for uh, for the, the federal government. And it's really the standard that they need to build upon, as well as some of the DOD impact level X standards that those communities need to build. We are engineering the managed services of GitHub to meet those highest standards from a security and compliance standpoint that our DOD and intelligence community brethren would need to adhere to. And because the policy framework is built on and based on NIST 800-53, the learnings are able to very dynamically move down to adherence to PCI or other types of financial service regulatory burdens. So we are focusing on what would be the most difficult requirements to adhere to and then using those learnings, building into our managed services to make sure our customers can meet in a managed service or a SaaS-oriented service the baselines that they need to actually adhere to. Looks like uh, we're almost out of time. One last question. This is awesome from Anonymous. Isaac, any tips for getting tomatoes to grow successfully? <laughs> make sure you get the watering down, Pat. Otherwise, you'll have some scary-looking tomatoes. Okay, that's awesome. So it looks like we're out of time. Thanks again, all of you, for attending uh, via YouTube or watching live and asking questions. If you haven't already, be sure to register for FSI notifications and invites by visiting aka.ms slash FSI Fridays. We're also open to constructive feedback. Please send us your comments, suggestions, uh, aka.ms um, slash FSI Fridays feedback. Be sure to catch recordings at aka.ms slash FSI Fridays recap, where you can also post any follow-up questions that weren't covered today. And don't forget to subscribe and like our YouTube channel. Channel. Um, so, Joe Hansen, we have one more episode in 2020. Why don't you give the audience a preview of our 25th session? Thanks, Edwin. So, to wrap up the year, on December 18th, we'll speak with Charles Morris and Akiva Shuhov to discuss the trends we're seeing in data science and AI across financial services, as well as how firms can maximize the return of their AI investments, and how Microsoft is partnering with our financial services customers to create more value using data science and AI. You won't want to miss it. Thank you and see you next time on FSI Fridays.